Hello and welcome everybody. I'm Hamish. And my name is Anna. And we're going to talk to you today about registration of medical devices and IVDs in China. First, uh, a bit of housekeeping. We're going to talk for one hour today, including Q&A, 10 minutes Q&A at the end. So please uh, don't hesitate to put your questions into the chat box and we will gather those and answer them at the very end when our Managing Director, Stefan Fischer, will also join us. We have over 80 participants who have signed up from all over the world. Thank you very much for your attendance. As this is part of a four-part webinar series, we will today really set the base, the foundations, so that we can do a deep dive in the subsequent three webinars. If you'd like a copy of the slides, please email uh, in, in the email indicated in the chat box, or you can find us at king at kizema.com. A recording of this webinar will be provided to attendees in a follow-up email. As I've already said, if you have questions, please put them in the chat box and we'll answer them at the end. So first, I would like to introduce Kizima to you. Kizima stands for China Service Management and we are a turnkey regulatory affairs solution provider for China and we help companies from all over the world with the product safety registration of their products. But I don't want to talk about us any longer so we will share our company brochure which you can download now. You can also see on this slide Stefan Fischer. He is the founder and managing director of the Kizima Group. He founded Kizima in 2002 and he actually has experience in China since the late 80s and he will join us for the Q&A session in the end. My name is Anna. My background is in biology and in China business. I studied my bachelor's in the UK and my master's here in Hong Kong. And Hong Kong is where I am currently based. I've been working for Kizima since 2013 and I specialize in life science products, the registration of medical devices, IVD, cosmetics and health food. And I'm Hamish, I'm a lawyer by training, admitted in New South Wales, Australia and in Hong Kong, where I also reside. And my focus is medical device and IVDs, particularly the software variety. Let's begin. Oh. Yes, let's start. First, I would like to introduce the regulatory body in China to you, the so-called National Medical Products Administration, or short NMPA. And on this slide, you can see the evolution this NMPA has undergone in the past. It was named different names. As you can see, SDA, then it was renamed to SFDA. A lot of people still know it under the name CFDA. But during the 13th um, National People's Congress, China's cabinet decided to rename it to NMPA in March 2018. The regulatory body was not only renamed multiple times, the responsibility scope has changed over the years. And on the right side, you see the current responsibility spectrum of the NMPA. Co uh, contrary to what the name suggests, the NMPA is not only responsible for the medical devices, but also for in vitro diagnostics, pharmaceuticals, and cosmetics. And the food related items that I have highlighted in gray are now being taken care of by a completely separate regulatory body, the State Administration for Market Regulation and the CFE, the Center for Food Evaluation. And today's webinar will focus on medical devices, including IVDs, because IVDs follow medical device registration or regulation, I should say, of course, over the last couple of years, so many IVD specific rules and guidelines have been released, but the overarching regulation is the medical device regulation. And on this slide, I would like to introduce the regulatory framework to you in three layers. On the first layer, you can see 
there are about 20 regulations which are very general in nature. On the second level, you can see there are about 100 implementation rules and these help to explain how to enforce the regulation. And on the lowest level are the very detailed rules and guidelines. These are product specific. And of course, um, I have not uh, tried to be comprehensive here. This is just a tiny snapshot, for instance, for the guidelines, I picked out some dental related guidelines. We often get asked where we can find these rules and these announcements because the official language of the NMPA is Chinese. All of these are published in Chinese language. And here you can see that the website of the NMPA has also developed over the last couple of years. And there's even an English language website now, which is a great development. Nevertheless, the information you can find on there is still somewhat limited. It's good news that they try to release more and more English information, but uh, right now, unfortunately, it's not um, as comprehensive as, as we would hope for. Here are the different types of NMPA approvals. And on the left-hand side, you can see the different types of approvals for class one. And on the right hand side, the different types of approvals for class two and three. The main differentiation is that the initial application for class one medical devices is a filing procedure. This document-based filing procedure um, will then lead you to a certificate which is valid indefinitely. And therefore there's no renewal necessary. On the other hand, for class two and three medical devices, the certificate that you will receive upon successful registration is valid for five years, meaning that a renewal application is needed. And the deadline for applying for a renewal application is officially six months prior to expiration. However, we remind our clients as early as two years beforehand because if the tests specifications or some important standards have changed, it is possible that as part of the renewal, you have to perform some testing and testing takes a long time. So it is better to start thinking about the renewal earlier than later. Then there is the approval change, the third one you can see here on the slide, and we differentiate between approval change with tests because of major changes, for instance, if there has a change in function or main structure versus approval change without tests if there has been a minor update. Nevertheless, you have to inform the NMPA. And you might see that in gray, I wrote extension or product change. So what's the difference between extension and product change? Extension is if you add an additional model to your already um, registered model in the certificate and afterwards you can sell all of these whereas with um, a product change you override the registered model with a new one and after this you can only sell the new model in China. And important to understand here is also that the added model or this model change has to be the same or smaller. So if you're interested in, um, for instance, changing, um, uh, well, maybe let me phrase it differently, the scope of the specifications and functionality of the added model has to be the same or smaller. Then there is administrative change. This is if your address changes or you perform a NMPA legal agent change, more on this later on, and IFU change. I guess what I want to say here with this slide is whenever there are any changes, keep the NMPA informed. This is very, very important. Thanks, Al. In this slide, we have extracted some statistics from the regulator's annual report on medical device and IVD registrations. Applications here are shown in yellow and uh, successful submissions in blue. 
You can see there was a large fall in 2017 due to stricter requirements brought in by the regulator relating to EMC, electromagnetic compatibility testing, as well as clinical trial requirements, which we'll talk a little bit about later. However, by 2019, uh, this backlog had largely resolved and you can see that the explosion in registrations gives some indication of the demand of the medical device and IBD market in China. Roughly one third of the registrations are IVDs and two thirds are medical devices. Also of interest is the, uh, is the class in, or the, the largest number of product groups registered in China. Dental instruments was the first uh, and that uh, overtook me medical imaging equipment compared with 2019. Passive implantable devices and surgical instruments for neurological and cardiovascular came in the fourth position of founding devices rounded out the top five. The, uh, the largest, or, or rather the, the top registering countries in 2020 were USA, was the, the top and it has been for a number of years now. Germany and Japan and Korea were, were two, three and four respectively and I've also listed on the slides some of the other uh, top 10 countries. You can see from these stats that the composition of China's domestic medical production, whilst it has shifted over the years and increasingly is going up the technology curve from low-end consumables to the, to the more technology-intensive products, um, what, what really is in demand are the high-end products globally in China. China is still 10 to 15 years behind by its own accounts in terms of uh, manufacturing uh, technical capabilities. So before you can start the registration process, you have to figure out the risk class of your medical device and IVD. And there are three risk classes in China, one, two, and three. The NMPA does not differentiate between class 2A and B. And the risk class in other countries can often serve as an indication of the risk class in China. However, not always, as you can see here in the slide with the arrows, it can happen that you fall into a higher risk class in China because the NMPA is quite conservative and strict. So how do you find out the risk class of your medical device? First, you look at the so-called medical device classification catalog. This was issued in 2017 and very recently in December 2020 updated. This catalog is vividly provided with over 2000 product examples and 22 product categories. So it is actually quite straightforward to find your risk class. If you are unsure, the next step would be to look at the rules for medical device classification. And if there are still uncertainty in some borderline cases, it is possible to apply for an official NMPA classification. And then the NMPA will inform you of their official decision. I mentioned that in December, the classification changed for medical devices. And this is what you can see in this slide. Nine products were reclassified from risk class two to one. And six products were reclassified from class three to two. And what I gather from this is that, yeah, the regulatory body in, in China realized that they were too strict in some of, in some of their decisions. IVD reagents follow a separate classification. They have their very own classification catalog, which was um, put into effect in 2014, so quite a long time ago. And this is why uh, the update, which occurred in October last year, was long overdue. And in this update, uh, the NMPA released uh, or changed and updated the product information of 29 IVD reagents. Um, also to down classify the, some of the products. And you can see some typical examples of class one, two, and three on the slide. 
I want to stress that any IBD reagents labeled with radionuclides or those used for blood source screening do not fall under medical device regulation because they are actually regulated as drugs. So this is a completely different topic. After you've determined your product risk classification, which of course helps determine the appropriate regulatory pathway, which Anna will talk about shortly, you need to consider naming your product's local representative in China, which is called the NMPA legal agent. The NMPA legal agent is the direct interface with the regulator. It must be a Chinese legal entity. The NMPA legal agent role is now one that uh, is required throughout the product life cycle. The role is increasingly important as the NMPA scrutinizes post-market activities more closely. You can see that previously uh, it used to be called the China Registration Agent as well as the After Sales Agent, but now there's just one role, NMPA Legal Agent. The NMPA Legal Agent formally submits the application dossier, interfaces with local test labs for, for local testing. It accepts the NMPA certificate when that's uh, um, succeed when it succeeds and arranges for the first import of the product. In the post-market surveillance role, the NMPA legal agent submits adverse event filings, also submits its annual reports and supports overseas factory inspections. So what are your options for a local NMPA legal agent? You have three. You can have your own subsidiary in China. You can select a distributor or you can select a third party. Choosing your own subsidiary in China is the perhaps the belts and braces approach, but it requires substance in China. It's obviously more expensive and time consuming, and you need to make sure you have all uh, regulatory activities implemented. If you select your distributor, um, that's often a lower cost upfront option, but carries with it risks. And we counsel caution to our customers when, when selecting a distributor, because the distributor will then uh, get a look or certainly see all your important product um, uh, product information that is submitted as part of the application dossier. It also restricts your flexibility when trying to deal with other, other distributors. Your other option is a third party. Uh, Kazema acts as, as a legal agent, for example, for a number of our customers. This allows additional flexibility because you can, as is often needed in China, because it is such a large market, one distributor cannot cover the whole area. Also, um, having a third party helps with keeping up to date and making sure you're in satisfaction with the requirements. Now I will go deeper into the filing and registration process of medical devices and IVDs. And I'll start with class one products. The timeline that you can see here, seven weeks, is based on our long experience in the market. This is a best case scenario, but certainly a realistic best case scenario. The filing process is a completely document based process. It starts with the preparation of some docs, then the writing of the PTR, the product technical requirements. This is always one of the core documents. Mm, very important document we're going to talk about mm. a bit more later. Yeah, and the notarization, and last but not least, the submission on site. The, as you can see, there is no testing needed for class one products and also no clinical trial. And after you have submitted your application, the NMPA issues the certificate uh, very, very quickly. And an example of such a certificate is visible on this slide. So if you see this in your documents, keep it very safe. This document um, is, or this certificate is valid indefinitely and needed for all sorts of um, yeah, processes in, in China. If we now compare the filing with the registration of a class two and three product, it looks more complex. There are certainly more steps involved, including testing and potentially clinical trial. But let's start at the beginning. It starts with the collection of the registration documents. 
And we send our clients a document checklist, including templates. And I have included a typical document checklist in the following three slides. This is for a class two active medical device from a European manufacturer. And what you see here in position three, one of the things we ask for very early on is the instruction for use, because based on this, we write the PTR, the product technical requirements. But here are some of the other documents, including uh, research documents, manufacturing information, uh, risk management report, and so on. So this gives you uh, an idea of the documents. So based on the IFU, we write the PTR. And the PTR used to be called registration standard prior to 2014. This is basically the test specifications and the prerequisite for agreeing on type tests with the test laboratory in China. And the laboratory uses this PTR to determine the sample list in accordance with the test method and standards. It also serves as a basis for the contract between the test lab and the NMPA legal agent. Typical tests could be performance tests, electronic safety tests, EMC tests, and biocompatibility tests. Then the samples are transported into China. A good coordination between the manufacturer, the customs broker, and the lab are very beneficial here. The products can enter China as so-called temporary import, uh, temporary import and export of goods. And this is import duty free. The products are then allowed to remain within China for six months. Six months is, of course, not so enough time for the test. So this can be prolonged in six month intervals. Then the tests follow. Here you can see I'm talking in this bubble about tests and clinical, but I will do one after the other. So let's talk about the tests first, because type tests need to be performed in China. The time frame is about 18 weeks for uh, without and 36 weeks with bio biocompatibility test. The reason why tests have to be performed, even though they have been performed outside of China, is because the NMPA does not accept tests according to CB scheme, certification body scheme. And in this regard, I'd like to introduce the standard system in China to you. GB, you can see on the right side, the Chinese standards, GB stands for Guo Biao, which means national standard. YY is uh, indication for industry standard. And if a T is mentioned, the T is, for instance, GB-T, this means um, it is recommended. recommended. But the NMPA requests this. Um, so let's go through them step by step. In the first line, Relevant for active medical devices, you see safety tests have to be performed. The Chinese standard is about 85%, similar to the international standard. On the next line, you see electromagnetic compatibility tests have to be done despite the Chinese standard being close to identical to the international one. Having said that, as you can see, quite an old version of the international standard, but the um, this national standard is going to be updated in 2023. This is what I've added here in a red note. For body contacting medical devices in the third line, biocompatibility testing can be potentially waived. So this is the only test that you can possibly avoid having. So how do you know if you have to redo the biocompatibility test in China? The NMPA has certain requirements. One of them would be, for instance, the test has to be performed in a lab with um, good lab laboratory practice, GLP. So this would be one of their requirements. So if, if your biocompatibility test ticks all the boxes, this is the one test that you can potentially avoid in China. 
And then, of course, you have to show what quality management and risk management measures are in place. Because of the local testing, of course, you need to make sure you have good relationships and knowledge of the local testing requirement and environment in China. Uh, there are around 50 different testing centers, but of course you must make sure that it's a qualified lab by the NMPA. We've listed here 10 of the more important. Uh, your testing application submission requires, of course, most importantly, the PTR, but also IFU labels in Chinese, testing unit and tools. Having good relationships with the test labs is very helpful to getting a timely and, 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 uh, and relatively quick testing. The uh, delays in, test, in local testing have um, increased since COVID times because of the um, additional requirements put on. Uh, so it depends on being flexible in terms of when you can actually test. You also want to make sure, as we've set out here, that your test lab has the relevant competency for your product. Now I'd like to address clinical and the clinical documentation um, next to the test report is so important for your application to see. So not all applicants have to undergo a clinical trial in China. And now I'd like to discuss how you can find out whether this is relevant or not. So here I have a decision tree for different clinical pathways in China. Let's start with risk class one. In this case, a simplified clinical evaluation is sufficient, no clinical trial needed. Remember, it's a completely document-based procedure. For class two and three, however, clinical trial could be considered. The first step is to look at the clinical trial exemption catalog. And this exemption catalog is actually updated usually on an annual basis, most recently on the 19th of January this year, where the news version was released. And if your product is listed on this exemption list, then a simplified clinical evaluation is sufficient. If not, then since 2018, the NMPA allows applicants to utilize overseas clinical trial data. Of course, for this, the clinical trial from abroad has to meet NMPA's requirements. And there are a couple things to consider, including ethical, legal, and scientific principles of NMPA. But if your overseas clinical trial data qualifies, then this is a viable option. If you don't have your own clinical data or it doesn't meet the requirements, then there's one last option. And this is to write a full-blown CER, a clinical evaluation report based on a predicate device for multiple predicate devices. And a predicate device is a equivalent device that already successfully gained NMPA approval in China. So this is the first prerequisite. Um, and if, yeah, well, I, I guess the difficulty with, with this option is that if the predicate device is from a direct competitor, gaining access to some of the information that is crucial for the CER is going to be hard. They're not going to be happy to share confidential information such as Production information. Yeah, or material information for passive medical devices. So, um, yeah, so this could be uh, a hurdle. But if you have a previous generation model in China, this is fantastic. Yeah. It's also worth mentioning that we do have some success with obtaining predicate device information uh, through either a formal application to the NMPA, although that um, takes time and will have a lot of information redacted or through, through other legal means. Mm. Anna, one question perhaps is, is about, and we get asked quite often, the clinical evaluation report. How is that different from one in the EU? Um, that's a good question. The purpose of a CER in China versus in Europe is a completely different one. It serves a completely different function. The purpose of a Chinese 
clinical evaluation report is to demonstrate equivalence and justify why differences between the to be registered device and the predicate do not negatively impact safety and effectiveness. So there is zero information about state of the arts or you know meeting essential requirements. All of this information is, is completely irrelevant and um, yeah. So it's important to kind of forget a little bit about what you've done maybe in Europe and look at China in a completely new light. And if none of this works, you have to do a clinical trial in China. And one of yeah, our quite popular services is a feasibility study report where we analyze what clinical pathway is ideal for your specific case. Um, Based on your product information and yes. clinical trial data. Yes, and finding out or, or determining the clinical pathway early on in the registration process is certainly a good idea. Also, just to say, I, I see we're getting a few questions coming through, which is great. Um, hope you don't mind. We'll, we'll wait until the end and we can answer all those in one go. Fantastic. The preparation of the registration documents, ideally you would do them in parallel to the type tests to be time efficient. And after this, the application to see is submitted to NMPA and after their technical review they will issue a supplementary notice and this supplementary notice is very important it explains what additional information and documentation has to be submitted and manufacturers have to provide all the support supporting documentation within one year you only have one supplementary phase meaning you can't just half-heartedly uh, reply to the supplementary notice and later on should, I mean, hopefully not, but should the NPA then reject your application, you have to start from the very, very beginning again. So take this phase very seriously and make use of the three official meetings with an NMPA reviewer. So uh, yeah, the importance of the supplementary phase. Then after this, the NMPA will perform their second technical review and after the administrative approval, the certificate is issued, which is valid for five years. And the a common or the best case, but realistic timeline for a class two registration is 18 months and for a class three registration is 21 months without clinical trial. If a clinical trial is needed, then that adds easily a year or maybe longer uh, to this process. Once your certificate is issued, it is the NMPA legal agent's job to collect it. Uh, and thereby the NMPA legal agent has the authority to import the approved product. We've included on this slide um, an example of a class two or three registration certificate it's a one pager with the key information, including a unique certificate number, the name of the applicant, uh, which is the legal manufacturer, production address, um, you know, product name, accessories, etc. Importantly, imp appended to this certificate are the product technical requirements, the PTR that Anna has mentioned earlier. It is of equal importance to the certificate itself. Um, you can see that we've also just set out in the blue box um, a recent development from the NMPA where they are trialing electronic certificates. These will be issued as well as the paper versions. However, um, this does not include an electronic version of the PTR. They are still only issued in original. The implications for this um, relate to what you, what you need the originals for. As I've said out on this slide are some of the reasons why. It has a very important role to play in renewals and also extensions changes for both product and administrative changes. Fortunately, if you have a copy only of the NMPA certificate and PTR, that should be sufficient for, for the extension or product change. But for a renewal, you generally require the original, so make sure you guard it closely. Sometimes, or, or fairly often actually, for uh, companies that have distributor as their NMPA legal agent, 
they can well play games around, oh, here's the certificate or here's the PTR. So that's just a top tip to be aware of. Make sure you, at a minimum, get a copy of that certificate as well as the PTR. There are some instances when you can actually apply for a new uh, certificate if your certificate is lost or you're having so much um, difficulty with your distributor that you just can't get it. However, this requires an NMPA legal agent change first. This is if you appoint your distributor as NMPA legal agent, which of course is not always you know, the case as we explained earlier. It's not necessarily the same person, yeah. Yeah, and, and really what we're just trying to say here is originals still play a big role in the uh, regulatory framework in China. Mm -hmm. So do try to guard them closely. The NMPA itself has a database uh, with lots of interesting information about various products. Uh, so you can search and find what your competitors, for example, are up to because all products that are registered with the NMPA appear on this database. However, it is only in Chinese, unfortunately, at this stage. Uh, the first registration you should check is your own because the registration on the database must be consistent with your certificate. And your actual product, of course. And your product. Otherwise, this can well trigger uh, overseas factory inspections which, um, of course, otherwise generally aren't required. We've listed here some of the information that can be found on the database, including the certificate number, model name, and intended use. This is um, pretty much the same as what the front page of the certificate shows. Mm. And actually, recently, we have experienced also that discrepancies um, to the Chinese label, and I'll uh, talk about this um, next. Oh. Okay, in the later slide, um, is also causing some trouble. So just make sure that all information across the board is um, consistent. Consistent, yes. consistent, exactly. And it's your NMPA legal agent's responsibility to ensure this is the case. Now, another question apart from timeline that we are always asked is what are the associated costs with a registration of a medical device? And what you can see on this slide are the official submission fees for NMPA approvals for imported medical devices. And these are in renminbi, so the Chinese currency. If I were to quickly convert it for class two, this would be around 25,000 euros for initial registration. And for class three, this is around 38,000 euros. However, this is by no means the full cost that you have to plan for. This is just one aspect. So when asking a service provider to provide you with an offer, please ask for a full cost calculation that includes everything, including the test fees and the um, yeah, writing of all the necessary documentation, authorizations, import fees, everything. everything. Yeah. So I'm just going to give you some ballpark figures. So get a pen ready um, for class one. Full cost would be between three and six to 10,000 euros, I'd say, depending on the product, of course. For class two, you have to expect something between 60 and 80,000 euros. And for class three, between 80 and 110,000 euros. And this would include the entire stop, so uh, one-stop shop. These numbers that I just named, again, were excluding clinical trial. If a clinical trial is needed, this um, this this number would, would be different. We are also a CRO, so we can give you information on this, um, but this is also quite product specific. What I'd like to mention here, uh, again, before I move on, is that the numbers you can see on the slide are applicable for imported medical devices. The fees for domestics or Chinese manufacturers look a bit different. And this, the reasons for this is that for class two, manufacturers apply with their provincial MPA. And provincial MPAs have completely different application fees depending on the province. 
some of them heavily subsidize this and in Hunan province, I believe it's, uh, according to my knowledge, it's even for free. And for class three, the initial or the new registration, you just half this amount. The justification by the NMPA in the past for this was that Chinese applicants have to go through factory inspections routinely. So as part of every registration, a factory inspection is performed, which is a huge under, um, undertaking. Whereas for foreign applicants, this is not being done. Hamish mentioned overseas factory inspections earlier, but this is really only if there is a serious concern, a serious ad adverse event, for instance, that triggers such an overseas factory inspection. To give you a number, in 2019, there were 24 overseas factory inspections. But apart from this, the registration procedure for an imported medical device or a domestic medical device is the same. The requirements, the steps are the same. It's just the, the fees are, uh, are different. And domestic yeah, uh, com uh, domestic applicants deal often before class one and two deal with their provincial NPAs. And that experience can sometimes be better, sometimes maybe not better, depending on how experienced they are with your particular product. Um, the Chinese label, the draft version has to be actually already submitted as part of the application dossier. And the information of a typical Chinese label you can see here on the slide, but if there are any space constraints, the information that has to be displayed are the name, model and specifications as well as the production date and the device lifetime. And if there's not enough space for anything else, just as a comment, you know, that refers to the instruction for use for, for further details. And this Chinese label, after successful NMPA registration, is then also registered with the Chinese customs when you first import your medical device after certification. And for subsequent imports, you can attach the Chinese label either abroad or in China. Up to you how you manage this. Well, that takes us to the end of our substantive presentation today. We're just going to have a, a bit of a short wrap up here, uh, and then we'll ask you briefly for some input by way of a poll for our next webinars, and then we'll answer your questions. So today we talked about the classification of medical devices and IVDs in China. Be prepared to be confronted with a high risk class in some cases. We also talked about the importance of your NMPA legal agent and its role. It um, is, is, in, is taking on increased importance as the um, life cycle focus and scrutiny of the NMPA evolves. Mm. I showed you a typical example of an application file checklist. The most important documents are the test reports and the clinical documents. We spoke about the process and timelines of registrations. It's always good to determine your clinical pathway early on in the process. And we spoke about standards. There, the, yeah, China is trying to align with international standards, but this um, is, is in most cases it's not. Slow process. Yeah. But, but it is also a member of the IMDRF. So, you know, it's a space to watch and they are trying to harmonize slowly, mm -hmm. slowly. Yes, true. Um, with regards to type tests, overseas biocompatibility test is the only one that can be waived at this stage. And then I spoke about different clinical pathways and finished off with some cost considerations. So this just gives a short summary about what you can look forward to coming up in our future webinars, where we're going to do a deep dive onto some specific regulatory topics some hot topics um, and some perhaps we don't even know about yet because they're still to be released. But uh, in 8th of June, you can at least look forward to some more information about your Chinese company name, uh, UDI requirements and from foreign to China made medical devices. 
for our webinar in September, uh, we'd like to hear your input as to what you'd be most um, what you'd most like to hear about. So we're just going to publish a poll now. We'd be grateful for your input. Either post market surveillance you'd like to hear more about, or the QMS, or alternative pathways to registration, or finally software and, and software products in particular. We can see the votes coming in, and uh, actually people are interested in, in all the topics, uh, but it looks like alternative entry pathways. Okay, thank you very much for voting. Um, here are some more information about us. Otherwise, we'd like to thank you very much for joining. And uh, as we said, there'll be a follow-up email with a recording of the webinar, so you can view it at your leisure. And if you'd like a copy of the slides, please email. Thank you for your time. Thank and we look so forward much. to seeing you at the next uh, webinar. Yeah. Okay, goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.